What I'm going to tell you today is going to be simultaneously frightening and angst inducing on one hand. On the other hand, you will find it giddingly exciting and invigorating. What you're going to learn is something which is very valuable in any pursuit, in any field. I think if someone really absorbs and assimilates this message, it can help them make a ton of money. It can help them financially. It can help them in their family life. It can help expand their intellectual and spiritual achievements. Whatever your dreams may be, what you're going to learn right now may help you achieve it. Now, you're saying that, oh, okay, Rabbi Wolbe is overselling it as he always does. But listen and tell me when we're done if I'm overselling this. Or maybe I'm underselling it. We just read in the Parsha, Parsha's Noah, the story of Noah, of Noah and his family and the animals and the ark, 300 cubits by 50 by 30. Humanity had a rough going in the Parsha. They were essentially all destroyed with the exception of eight people, Noah and his three sons and their respective wives. And that was only the first episode in the Parsha where humanity warranted a comprehensive destruction. Of course, we have the, the flood and the run-up to the flood. And the land was filled with robbery. And people had become corrupt due to a collection of egregious, of unconscionable sins. Humanity was condemned to be completely destroyed. They were given a 120-year grace period. Noah was built in the ark trying to convince people to repent. Even when the rain started falling, there was still a chance for humanity to do an about face and to repent. But alas, it was just no one his family that entered the confines of the ark. And there was a colossal year-long flood. And with that, humanity was done away with. That's the beginning of the Parsha. And then... Several hundred years later, the people of the world again behaved in a manner, in a way that warranted total destruction. And that's the episode of the Tower of Babel. Humanity orchestrated a coordinated assault on heaven on high. And truthfully, this second cadre, the second cohort, the second generation was guilty of crimes against God that were equally as egregious as the crimes of the generation of the flood. But they weren't destroyed. Instead, God dispersed a unified people with one language into many different warring, competing nations and languages. Humanity was not destroyed in this second wave Instead, they were balkanized. And the question is, why? What changed? We have two generations, the flood and the dispersal. In one, the generation of the flood, because of their crimes, they were completely destroyed. Yet, the second generation, they don't suffer the same fate as the generation of the flood. Yes, they're punished. They're dispersed, they're balkanized, but they're not destroyed. And the question is, what's the difference? And of course, we know the answer because we read what happened in between the flood and the dispersal. There was a change in the divine treatment of humanity. God changed the way he treats humanity. We read about it in chapter 8. After Noah exits the ark, it was a rough year, and uh, he leaves the ark. And we read in chapter 8, verse 20 and 21, he builds an altar and he offers sacrifice to God from all the kosher animals and birds. You remember that he brought a couple extra pairs of kosher animals. Rashi tells us 
This was in anticipation of when they leave the ark, he'll offer them as sacrifices. And indeed, that's what he did. And then in verse 21, we read how God responded to Noah's sacrifice. The verse tells us, God smelled the pleasant aroma. Of course, we have to know that that, we have to know what that means. Obviously, God doesn't smell, but this is the Torah speaking to us in the way that we understand. And God said to his heart, I will never again curse the land because of man, for the inclination of the heart of man is evil from his youth, and I will never again strike all living beings as I did. So between the errors of the flood and the dispersal, there's this declaration of God. I'm not going to do this again. I am no longer going to destroy all living things as I did during the flood. And therefore, when humanity became deserving of flood-like treatment several centuries after Noah's emergence from the ark, instead of being destroyed with a second flood, they were punished with dispersal, different nations, different languages, different lands. They were balkanized, but they were not treated with a second flood. So that's kind of the, the trajectory of what happened in Aparsha. It starts off with the people behaving terribly, and there's the flood, but then there's the sacrifice and God's declaration, and then people behave terribly again in a way that should match the behavior of the flood, but they're not destroyed. Instead, something else happens to them, but, but they survive. Now, in his comment to this verse, verse 21 of chapter 8, the Ramban, it's just an incredible comment. And there's a few different angles that we could take this, this comment of Ramban, I'll quickly go through the first thing that he says, which I, I find so fascinating, so astonishing, and then we'll talk about the main point that I want to convey to you today. So he begins by noting the unusual terminology. God said to his heart. What does it mean, God said to his heart? What does that even mean? Of course, we know we don't believe that God is corporeal in any way. God doesn't have a heart. So what does it mean God said to his heart? So the Rabban explains what this term means. Typically, when the Torah uses the words, and God spoke, God said, there is someone on the receiving end who is a prophet. So God speaks to Noah. God speaks to Abraham, and then Abraham, or to Moshe, or to Aaron, or to Jacob, or to Isaac. The notion of God speaking appears all over the whole Torah. But almost always, invariably, there's someone who's listening. There's a recipient to that message. When the Torah uses the term, and God said to his heart, that means that there is a declaration of God that no one heard. This change, how God responded to the sacrifice, he smelled the aroma, and he said, I'm not going to destroy humanity again. That statement, so to speak, of God was not revealed to any prophet at the time. The change was only revealed centuries hence when God tells Moshe, okay, write down the Torah, write down Barashas, he writes down Barashas, write down Bara, he writes down the first verse, the second verse, and the third verse, writes the whole Parshas Barashas, Parshas Noah, chapter 8, verse 21, God tells Moshe, write down, and God said to his heart, and then for the first time was revealed to humanity that after Noah offered those sacrifices after the flood, God changed his behavior. He decreed that thenceforth he will not strike all living things again. That's how the Ramban explains this unusual terminology, and God spoke to his heart. So I find this to be an incredibly astonishing insight. We have a few hundred years after the flood, a second generation of people behaving in a way different than the nation, the generation of the flood, but a way that was equally as egregious and equally warranted total destruction. A second flood-like event should have been expected. But the reason why God did not do that it's because of the sacrifices of Noah after the flood. But no one knew about that. Even Noah himself had no idea 
of the impact that his sacrifice had. Noah, with this decision to offer sacrifices to God after the flood, that effectuated a change in divine treatment of humanity, but no one was aware of it. Humanity had a savior in that Noah was righteous and did something that was an entreatment of God and it changed the way God thenceforth treated humanity. But for centuries, no one knew. No one knew. But for centuries, no one knew. This transformation was only revealed to Moshe. So to me, this is just a wonderful example of the fact that you know, we're living in our world and we're making decisions and we think we could piece together the cause and effect and why things happen. But this is an example of how we're totally unaware of the impact of human behavior and how humans can actually change the way God cha- relates to the world, interfaces with the world. And it's possible that someone did something and for centuries, no one's aware of it. And only once God reveals it to Moshe does it become known. But that small deed of Noah actually saved all of humanity from a second flood-like event. To me, this is just an incredible, incredible insight. There is like a, a system of cause and effect, and there's a, a ledger, there's a tally, there is effectuation, is change that's happening in heaven. And unless we get a little window, a little insight, we have no idea what's happening. There is what's important in heaven, and there's what we consider important, and those two are very frequently on different wavelengths. And here we see just an example of what that looks like. Noah does something that unless Moshe came and revealed to us, or God revealed to Moshe and Moshe told to us, we would have no idea of this tremendous impact. To me, this was an incredible insight that it's not what I wanted to focus on, but because the Ramban that addresses this verse, he starts off at this point, I wanted to share it. But what I really wanted to focus on was the continuation of this Ramban and the implications of what he says. The verse tells us, God smelled the aroma of Noah's sacrifice. And he said to his heart, what did he say to his heart? I'm not going to destroy humanity again. And he explains why. I will never again curse the land. Due to man. For the inclination of the heart of man is evil from his youth. And I will never again strike all living beings as I did. What does it mean that I will not destroy man because of man? Avur Adam. For the heart of man is evil from his youth. What does that even mean? What's the rationale of God's change of treatment? So the Rabban offers two explanations. We know that man, the term man in Hebrew was Adam. But the word Adam also refers to Adam, the original man. So in the Rabban's two explanations, In one of them, he says when the verse says man, it says Adam, it's referring to the original Adam. And he explains, God says, I'm not going to destroy humanity because of Adam. When humans sin, that can be traced back to Adam's original sin. And had Adam not sinned, well, we would not have a Yetzirah, we would not have an evil inclination, and we would have nothing that pulls us away from God. And therefore, how could you blame subsequent humans if it wasn't for Adam? We would not have the evil inclination, and we wouldn't sin. And therefore, ultimately, if we strip away everything, we, we discover the real culprit. It's really the original Adam. And therefore, when the people of the dispersal, they're behaving in this terrible way, they're rebelling against God. We may think it's their fault. No, it's actually Adam's fault. 
And therefore, humanity should not be blamed for their sin. That's argument. That's explanation number one. When the verse says Adam, it's referring to the original man. In the second interpretation, the Ramban says that no. When it says Adam, it means humanity. And he explains that the argument for never destroying humanity again is because after all, we start off life and we have an evil inclination. And from the very beginning of our life, we're under the spell of the evil inclination. And when we get older, we have the good inclination, of course, but it's no match. It's no match for the evil inclination. We've been trained. We've been raised. We've been reared to be sinners. After all, we're under the thumb of the evil inclination. How can mankind be blamed? The Yetzirah has this head start. The deck is stacked against us. It's really hard to blame humanity. That's the second interpretation of the verse, courtesy of the Ramban, of why God won't destroy the world again. God won't destroy the world again, either because how could you blame humanity? It's really Adam's fault. Or how could you blame humanity? Neviates from youth. And indeed, in our parsha, in, in Parsha's Noah, when God was given a very good reason to destroy mankind again, he refrained because of this argument. That's the Ramban. And again, humanity did two sins or two generations of sinfulness that warranted, that each independently warranted destruction. But one of them came after Noah offered the sacrifice, and God said, I'm not going to destroy man because of the Yitzhah, the evil connection that starts from the youth because of Adam, because of the reasons that we talked about. But here's the massive, massive, ginormous question on the Ramban. And when we ask the question, the answer should be obvious, but the implications of that answer that's what's exhilarating and giddyingly exciting on one hand, but also terrifying and angst-inducing on the other hand. The massive question is that God, speaking to his heart, he says, I'm not going to destroy man. How can you blame man? How could you blame humanity? It's Adam's fault. He introduced the eight hour. That's one explanation of what God said. Or we have a Yetzirah, humans have a Yetzirah from the very youth. How could you possibly blame them? I'm not going to destroy humanity due to these reasons. Here's the massive question. Both of those rationales, both of those arguments were as equally true before the flood. Before the generation of the flood. So if these reasons are sufficient to prevent a second flood, after all, how could you blame them? It's Adam's fault. Or how could you blame them? They have a Yitzhah and they've had a Yitzhah since they were young. If these arguments are sufficient to prevent the second flood, why didn't they stave off the first flood? The argument would be equally valid before the first flood. How could you blame them? Don't you understand? <laughs> they come from Adam. It was Adam's fault. Blame Adam. How could you blame them? They have the us since they were young. And the answer was trying to get them to do all these sins. And the answer told the good inclination is no chance. As this Johnny come lately to try to fight against the wily king, the Yetzirah. That's a compelling argument the Torah tells us to not destroy humanity. But this argument is equally as valid and compelling before the flood. Why was there the flood to begin with? That's a massive question. And the answer, it's obvious. And the Ramban essentially says it himself. But the implication of the answer, that's the insight. 
The answer is, of course. This argument would be valid before the flood. And this argument could have prevented the flood. But when did Noah offer his sacrifice? Noah offered a sacrifice after the flood. As a result of that, only after the flood was this argument presented, invoked, submitted, and therefore it only prevented the second flood, not the first flood. And we'll explain more how that works, but the astonishing implication is Noah was working for 120 years to build the ark, and it's this whole production, a whole year, everyone's crammed into the cells into the compartments of the ark for a whole year and there's rain everyone's being destroyed and besides for Noah and his family they have to rebuild all of civilization afterwards and all that could have been prevented humanity had the ace up their sleeve but no one played the card no one invoked it the arguments to save humanity was present it was present before the flood there was an argument exculpating humanity, and it was always there, but something needed to trigger it. Something needed to invoke it. After the flood, Noah offered sacrifices, and that sacrifice served as an entreatment from God, of God. And that sacrifice invoked these arguments. That sacrifice, which is a form of prayer, that actualized, that brought to the table the argument that was always there. It was always ready. It was always present. But no one invoked it. And therefore, it wasn't submitted. You have an argument, a good argument, a winning ar argument to save all of humanity. But unless you do something to offer it to God, to make your case before God, to surface that argument before God, God's not going to do it. And therefore, humanity could have staved off the flood, but no one presented the case. And that's the exhilarating and giddy, ingly exciting idea and it's terrifying as well. It's exciting because who knows? Like if you, if you compare, the, you compare the sides. Like on one hand, you have this argument that saves all of humanity, and you have that. All you need to do is just twist the valve. What you need to do is very small. Flip the switch. Make the case. Present the argument. Make the pitch. Express it. Do something to entreat God. All the work is done. The hard work, the hard work is done. It's the easy thing that was that was missing. And that's exciting. And of course, it's it's angst-inducing because we see humanity left so much on the table. By not submitting the argument, humanity left survival on the table. Now, I want to substantiate this idea. I'll show you a precedent for it. I'll show you a precedent for this idea that the essence of prayer is to actualize what's already there. You have it. You have the argument. You have the thing that you want. It's on the precipice. It's on the brink of surfacing. You need to just turn the valve, switch the switch. The verse tells us, chapter 2, Verse 5, it's at the very beginning of creation, but the shrubs of the field did not go into the land, and the grasses of the field didn't sprout, because God did not bring rain, because man was not there to work the land. That's chapter 2, verse 5, and Rashi explains the grass, the vegetation, all the shrubs of the field 
They're all standing at the very edge of the soil being ready to, to surface. But they were just standing there. And the reason why they were standing there is because there was no rain. But why was there no rain? Because there, no, there was no man. And there was no one to pray for rain. And once Adam came and prayed for rain, all those shrubs and all those grasses and all that vegetation that was just there, was, was there, standing, ready to surface, it just came up to the surface. The shrubs, the greenery, the grasses, it was all there on the ready. But something needed to kind of flip the switch to actualize it. It was on the brink of surfacing, but it had not quite yet surfaced because there was that missing piece, that prayer. It was waiting in the tunnel, ready to bloom and blossom, ready to flower and surface. But someone needed to do that little thing to trigger it. And that's prayer. And we know a sacrifice is a form of prayer. And that's what Noah did after he left the ark. He invoked the argument. The argument that was always there, was ready to bloom, was ready to blossom, it was in the tunnel, ready to surface past the soil. And of course, the terrifying implication of this is, had someone prayed or offered a sacrifice before the flood, had someone submitted the case actualized the case before the flood, God would have said to his heart, I'm not going to destroy mankind. For Matt, for Adam, from when they're very young, that argument was there, but it was in the realm of the potential and the actualization was lacking. And that's why humanity was destroyed. The reasons why the second flood didn't happen were present before the first flood. But there was no switch. There was no call out in treatment of God. No one made the case. No one presented the case. No one turned the valve, flipped the switch. And therefore, it remained ready to surface, ready to bubble forth but it still remained in the soil. This idea we find in the Talmud as well, in the book of Nida, on page 70b. It's talking about how to get rich. Get rich quick schemes, courtesy of the Talmud. But not just that, how to get rich, and how to become wise, and how to have male sons, Evidently, there was a preference to have male sons, to have continuity, to keep on the family name. Talmud says, well, what do you do? What do you need to do? I want to become wise. I'm a fool. Help me. So the sages tell us, well, there's a formula. Spend a lot of time in the yeshiva. Study a lot. And limit business interactions. Limit commerce. You have a finite amount of cognitive capacity and strength. Use that, dedicate that for Torah. That is the prescription for how to become wise. So the person who hears this, or the sages that heard this, they said, well, a lot of people tried. A lot of people wanted to be Shiva. And they spent a lot of time studying. And they really dedicated their cognitive capacities for Torah. They didn't work. They remained foolish. So the sage said, you know what, you're right. You must instead, or in tandem, you must request mercy from he that has all the wisdom. The wisdom comes from God. The knowledge, the insight, the understanding is all God's. Ask for mercy. So this is the Talmud says, wait a minute. You told me to study a lot and not to engage so much in commerce. And they said, well, you got to pray. If you need to pray, why are you telling me to spend a lot of time in the yeshiva? And the answer says the Talmud, this without that is insufficient. 
If you want to become wise, you need to do what you need to do to become wise, i.e. to study a lot, to dedicate your mind towards it. But you also need the switch, the trigger, the prayer. The Talmud proceeds to talk about how to become rich. What does a person need to do to become wealthy? Well, again, we have the prescription. Do a lot of business. Engage in commerce. Sell widgets, as they say. But do business with integrity. That's the formula. Do a lot of business. Dedicate yourself towards business, but do it with integrity. And again, the Talmud says, well, a lot of people tried that. It didn't work. So instead, you have to ask from he who has all the gold and silver, i.e., ask mercy from God. Well, if I have to ask for mercy from God, why are you telling me to do a lot of business? This, without that, is insufficient. Finally, the Talmud tells us, how do you have male sons, marry a fitting wife, and sanctify yourself in the moment of, uh, um, in the times of, of union of husband and wife. A lot of people tried, it didn't work. Ask mercy from he who has all the souls, i.e. prayer. So we have the same pattern. In anything you want, there are two components. You have to have the hard work. You have to have the dedication, the dedicated work, in whatever the field is. You want to succeed in business? You have to do business. You want to succeed in wisdom? You have to do it. But you also need the trigger. You also need something to make it surface. You also have to present your case before God. And if you don't, it's not sufficient. The Talmud, in the book of Baba Kama, on page 50a, it tells a wonderful story, a terrifying story. It's talking about a man named Nechunya. And he was a he was a ditch digger. He would dig ditches or wells. Why? To benefit people. People need water when they're traveling, and therefore you need you need a well, so you have to dig a well. Now they have all this fancy machinery. You could drill a hole in the ground, 8,000 feet, and then you drill it horizontally, and you do some hydraulic fracturing. Back in the day, you have a, you have a shovel, a primitive shovel. Go ahead. So there's one righteous person named Nechunya, and he was the well digger. And it was a tragedy. His daughter, young daughter, was running around playing. And she fell into one of the wells. And of course, there's the risk of dying. So no one knew what to do. They ran to the great sage, Rabbi Hanina Ben Dosa. He's a sage, we've talked about him in the past, one of the great sages of the time. And they said, Pray, pray for this girl. What's going to be? We're trying to save her. What's happening? Pray for her. So he said, don't worry. She's, she's at peace. She's unharmed. Nothing's going to happen to her. After an hour has passed, that's what he said. After two hours have passed, they're still freaking out what to do. He says, don't worry about it. She's okay. After three hours... She's missing in the well. And again, they're with the rabbit. What are we supposed to do? He says, okay, she came out already. So indeed, it turns out that she had survived. And they went to her and they said, how did you survive? And she told the whole story of how she survived. Abraham came and pulled her out. That's what they discovered. So they went back to the great rabbi and said, well, how, how did you know that? How did you know that she would survive, that she would be okay? Are you a prophet? This is at the time when prophecy already went extinct. Are you a prophet? 
So he said to them, no, I'm not a prophet, and I'm not the son of a, of a prophet. But this is what I know. We have a tzaddik here, this well digger. Nechon, he's a, he's a tzaddik, and he's dedicating his whole life to dig wells for the benefit of other people. It's inconceivable that someone who dedicates their life for this specific thing, for wells, it's inconceivable that his own child would die in that manner. Not a prophet. It, it, does, it doesn't jive with the almighty system. The almighty wouldn't take you know, the thing that you dedicated your whole life for and your own child will suffer. No, that, that's not going to happen. That's not a prophet. I just, I just know that this is not the way that God would behave. That's the Talmud. And if it ended over there, if the Talmud ended over there, it's a beautiful story with a wonderful lesson. When you dedicate yourself to something, you'll have special divine help in that area. But the Talmud continues. The Talmud gives this terrible little postscript to the story. Nevertheless, despite the fact that we have this insight from the great rabbi that someone who dedicates themselves to a given to a given objective will not suffer in that objective nevertheless his son not his daughter his daughter survived but his son he died of thirst even though you would expect you know he's a he's a well digger and you dig a well to access the water and you told me, you told me that, well, if someone dedicates themselves to a given objective for the benefit of others, they're not going to suffer. Their children are not going to suffer in that specific thing. So the argument you would imagine would be equally true for his son. His son shouldn't die of thirst. He spent his whole life dedicating himself to digging those wells so that other people have water. So you would imagine that if it saved this argument, saved his daughter, how come it didn't save his son? You know, the punchline of the story seems to negate the point. The whole point is, that, well, there's this rule. There's this rule. The rule states that the way, the way God behaves, that if someone really commits themselves to their whole life is about a certain, certain objective, provide water from wells for other people their children are not going to stumble in that area. Yet the Talmud concludes that this famous well digger's son, the son of the man who dedicated his whole life to providing water for the public, died of thirst. And the commentaries resolve this problem by explaining there was an argument here. There was a prayer here. The argument was that someone who commits themselves to a given objective, it seems inappropriate for their own children to die, to suffer in that specific area. That was a winning argument. And when they came to the great Rabbi Hanina, he made that argument and he invested that prayer. He presented that case. And you know what? God accepted it. By the time the second event happened with his son, the commentaries say, Rabbi Hanina had already passed. He had passed. And therefore the argument, the case, the rationale was still present. The argument was still available. Available. And no one made it. No one made it because Rabbi Hanina had passed. And therefore, although they had the ace up their sleeve, although they had a winning argument, an argument that was sound, an argument that was convincing, an argument that would actually change the divine treatment, of this well-diggers family, 
Rabbi Hanina had passed. And no one made that argument. And therefore, his son died of thirst. This is the idea that's terrifying, but it's also very exciting. It's terrifying when we learn that all the ingredients were in place for the flood to have been forestalled before it even happened. If only someone had brought the sacrifice, had prayed, had invoked this case before God, the flood could have been avoided. There was a winning argument. Someone needed to make it. And now, of course, he gets praised for saving humanity in the future. Sometimes what you need is just something very little a prayer, and without the prayer, even all the hard work won't be sufficient. You can do all the studying, get all the spending time in the yeshiva and really dedicating yourself to it. Without the prayer, you haven't presented your case. You can work really hard to make all your money, but without investing that final prayer, getting God on board, lobbying God to accept your argument, to accept your case. All that work is for naught. And it's a little bit, like we said, terrifying. Because who knows how much we're leaving on the table? Who knows, God forbid, how many, how many tragedies, how many disasters could have been avoided if someone prayed, if someone sacrificed, if someone made a case, made an argument. Who knows how much we could have sidestepped if we only lobbied God to accept our position. The effort was there. The work was there. The case was sound. The argument was winning. We have to make the case. It's exciting. It is invigorating. It's very demanding of us. It's also terrifying. A lot of people think, prayer, well, God knows what I need. God knows what I need to worry about it. Of course, God knows. This is the system. This is how the system works. You can have a winning argument. You can have a convincing case. It could work. But if you don't present it like those trees and that greenery and that vegetation and that shrubbery, it's, it's there. It's, it's ready to go. You have to summon it. And the way you summon it is with prayer. If you say, well, God knows what I need. So he'll give me. No, he won't. He knows what you need. And you deserve it. You put in the effort. There's a good argument. Sometimes God says, even without a good argument, that's called a free gift, a freebie. God gives out freebies. I will hear and I will listen because I am merciful. Chanun is from the word chinam, it's free. You have to ask. You have to petition. You have to lobby. You have to make your case. If you don't, you're leaving it on the table. And wouldn't that be a real shame? That was an idea courtesy of the Ramban from our parasha. We invest our life into work. Whatever arena it is, we want to become wise, we want to become wealthy, we want to have male sons. These are just examples that Talmud says. And the pattern is true by all three. We want to save humanity. It's possible that we already have whatever we need. It's just that's not presented. And if you don't formally submit it to the heavenly tribunal, it just remains in your, in your docket, in your folder. This is a very important lesson. Sometimes what's lacking is, is the smallest thing, just to file, file the papers. You, you didn't file, you didn't, you didn't hit send. You didn't send, you did all the work to organize all your thoughts and make this incredible email. You didn't submit your resume. You just didn't submit it. But it's such a great resume, they'll for sure hire me. Yeah, you got to give them the resume. 
God, words like that were told. You could have everything that you need, all the qualifications, all the arguments, all the reasons, all the rationales. You have to hit, submit, send. You have to invoke it. And if you don't, all that potential will remain subterranean below the soil. And it's just a total shame because who knows how much we could have gotten? Who knows how much we could have achieved? Who knows where we could have arrived at? Everything that we wanted, it's possible. We had the grounds for it. We just never turned the valve, made the, made the pitch. What's lacking may be the smallest thing. Had Noah offered the sacrifice before the flood? the flood would have been forestalled. So much so, we can deduce from this Ramban. I think this really demands of us. Now that we know, we know that even if there are the reasons for us to be saved in whatever area, like I said, this is something which should be very valuable in every area of our lives. Whatever it is, whatever it is that we want, we want to make sure that God's on board as well. And what that means is we have to submit our case. That is what prayer is. That's what Adam did when he came. He realized that the world needs rain. He said, please give us rain. And God says, okay, here's your rain. And all that vegetation that was all there, ready to go, at the very edge of the soil just came forth. That's the prayer of Noah. That's the prayer if you want to be wealthy, you want to be rich, you want to be wise, you want to have male sons. There's a winning case, a winning argument. This person shouldn't suffer in this particular way. In all these instances, it has to be submitted. If you don't entreat God, if you don't submit it, you cannot blame God. This is how he behaves. This is how it works. We're told in the very beginning of the Torah. Parshas Bereshis and Parshas Noach. Read just the, just the text of scripture with the commentaries with Rashi. We already know the first two Parshas twice. We know this idea. Whatever we want. Let me rephrase that. Not whatever we want. What we want, we can get in most cases. But we have to ask for it. We have to make our case. Let's not leave all this on the table. Make our case. Petition and entreat God and see what we can take, see what we can get. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows how much we're leaving on the table? And wouldn't that be a shame? I thank you for listening. This was an idea. I said, I'm going to come to the Torch Center. I'm going to have to share it. Because it's, it's too important. It's too important to not know this. You have to know this. This, this you have to know. This you have to know. And now that you know it, hopefully we will, all of us, will execute this idea. We'll, we'll actually utilize this idea. And whatever it is that we need, whatever it is that we want, we'll make our case. I thank you for listening. My email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com.